Bitcoin. Please to go mute. So there is a feedback um, from Nigel. Okay, is he muted now? It sounds like it. Okay, no, it stop. I can't tell because he's just on. Yeah. Has he dropped? I've missed this too. Uh, I'll investigate, but uh, yeah, we're now live. I can confirm. Okay, and thank you very much. In that case, we will get the meeting underway. So, a very good afternoon, members uh, and members of the public, if you are watching. And welcome to this meeting of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee of South Cambridgeshire District Council. My name is Grenville Chamberlain and I am the Chair of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee. Perhaps I could start with a few points of housekeeping if I may. Uh, please make sure that your device is fully charged or is charging. And please switch off your microphone unless I invite you to speak. When you've finished speaking, Please turn off your microphone immediately. Please speak slowly and clearly and do not talk over or interrupt anyone else. If you wish to speak on an item, please indicate this using the chat function, which Vice Chair Judith Ripith will be managing for me. And please don't use the chat for anything else that is public, so just indicate that you wish to speak. At present online with me at the moment are the following members of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee who I will invite to introduce themselves. Members, after I call your name, please turn on your microphone and introduce yourself so that we may note your presence. And please remember to turn your microphone off after your introduction. So first is Councillor Anna Bradman. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Councillor Anna Bradnam. I'm one of the members for Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Thank you, Anna. Next is Councillor Martin Khan. Hello, I'm Councillor Martin Khan. I'm Councillor for the Histon in Binkton Water Park Ward. Thank you, Martin. Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Uh, uh, no, Nigel Cathcart, member for Bradford Ward. Thank you, Nigel. Councillor Sarah Chung Johnson. Sarah Chung Johnson, one of the members for Long Stanton Ward. Thanks, Sarah. Councillor Graham Cohn. Uh, Councillor Graham Cohn, a uh, member for Fenditton and Fulbourne. Thank you. Councillor Claire Daunton. Um, hello, good evening. Um, Councillor Claire Daunton, one of the members for the Fenditton and Fulbourne Ward. Thank you. Councillor Douglas de Lacey. Douglas de Lacey from Girton and present. Thank you very much. Councillor Peter Fain. Councillor Peter Fain. I'm so, I've seen Peter Fain. Thank you, Peter. Councillor Joe Hales. Chair Councillor Harris hasn't joined us yet. He did let us know yesterday that he might be unable to attend the meeting, though he had been hoping to. OK, thank you. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yeah, present chairman. Thank you, Jeff. Councillor Steve Hunt. Yes, present Steve Hunt from Histon, Limpington and Orchard Park. Thank you. Councillor Judith Ripith. Bye bye, Good chairman. Um, member for Milton and Waterbeach Ward and Vice Chair. Thank you. Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. I'm Councillor Richard Williams. I'm the member for Whittlesford, Triplo, Heathfield and Newton. Thank you. And I note that we're also joined by a number of Cabinet members to, and who, to whom I extend a very warm welcome and also to Gavin Clayton, who will be addressing the meeting, meeting on behalf of the Labour Group later on through the meeting. Item one on the agenda is apologies for absence. Just perhaps before we just move to that, could I just indicate that for convenience, 
we have designated the main section of the agenda as item as section A. So that is the uh, first section that you received, which includes the minutes and other parts of the agenda. Uh, the section which includes the summary general fund revenue budget is section B. And the section which includes the housing revenue account budget is section C. We just found it a little easier to refer to those while we were talking in the pre meet last night. So reverting back to the agenda, item one is apologies for instance. Can I ask uh, Democratic Services if there have been any apologies for apologies of absence for the meeting, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll note apologies from Councillor Hales as he'd let us know that he might be unable to attend the meeting. However, if he joins late, then I'll um, rescind those. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, agenda item two is declarations of interest. Do any committee members have any interest that they would like to declare in relation to any of the items on the agenda this evening? No, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and I see just as we're coming to the minutes that Councillor De Lacey would like to speak on the minutes. So Douglas, would you like to speak before I introduce the uh, the minutes? Uh, well, it was to make, to make two small corrections, Chairman. Um, Councillor Richard Williams ought to have his doctorate added at uh, two points in the minutes. It should indeed. Thank you very much. We will arrange for that to be done uh, prior to the minutes being uh, approved. Um, in actual fact, there are also um, two other amendments which I will read to you. Um, since the draft minutes of the previous meeting were first issued with the papers for this meeting, officers have made a further amendment to the minute of the shared planning service update item, which was item six. Bullet point 10 of the second set of bullet points has been amended to the following. So that's the 10th bullet point and it refers to the number of TerraQuest staff. The new the minute will now read the number of TerraQuest staff have been reduced from six in total in development management and validation to one full time member of staff working on the processing of applications in the in development management. There are also amendments to wording from the fourth main paragraph after the second set of bullet points under the site. <coughs> And that starts the Joint Director of Planning and Economic Development informed the committee that the Council's use of extensions of time was not unusual compared to other local planning authorities. Stop. He informed the committee that there was a difference between major and minor applications in this regard. For major applications, there was a large use of extensions of time, whereas with minors, the use of extensions of time was more variable. The service had made efforts with local agents to try and reduce the use of extensions of time. However, the service had seen an increase in their use over the past 12 months. Further change here, the service had been challenged on its approach to the use of extensions of time. The joint director suggested bringing a report regarding the specific issue to a future scrutiny and overview committee meeting. The Joint Director of Planning and Economic Development informed the committee that a new process for exit interviews had been put in place with a designated officer within the service carrying out all exit interviews for all permanent and agency staff. And this provided consistency in the way these interviews were carried out. The joint director informed the committee that there had been a reduction in the number of plain, major planning applications during the COVID-19 pandemic. However, numbers had since increased, notably for household applications. In general, these application numbers had gone back to pre-COVID levels and officer workload remained high. 
So um, before I ask members if they're happy, I see that we have uh, two speakers who wish to comment on those on the on the minutes, one on the one on the main minutes, I think, and one on the amendment. So Councillor Rippert, I think. Um, just to say that I will have to abstain because I wasn't at that meeting. OK, that's fine. Right, Councillor De Lacey. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, when you read out that rather lengthy amendment, you omitted a statement and I wonder if that was deliberate. Um, and I'm trying to find it now. Um, oh yes, the very bottom of page three, the very last line, uh, you read uh, was not unusual compared to other local planning authorities. Yes. And you omitted and the statement. Were you yes. deliberately omitting that last uh, statement? Yes, I was. Thank you. Okay. So may I ask members subject to those amendments? <coughs> uh, and uh, Councillor Hunt, did you wish to come in on the minutes? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, just to say, I actually found that quite challenging to process and, and understand the complete scope of the changes. And I wonder if in future, if there are such extensive alterations that could be circulated in writing before the meeting. Yes, I'm, I'm sure under normal circumstances they could. But I, we only got this about 10 to 5 this afternoon. I see. Okay. So it is a, a really very, very late amendment, which I apologise. Um, so could I ask, subject to those changes, are members content to approve the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 17th of December 2020, or are there any other matters of accuracy that members would wish to raise? I agree those minutes with those amendments. Agreed. Thank you very Agreed. much. Agreed. Agreed. <coughs> Thank you all very much. I shall, I shall after that draw breath. <laughs> If I may, Chair, um, yes, oh, Chair yeah. Council Griffith, I, I, I wasn't at this meeting, so um, I'm not passing an opinion on that. No, that's fine. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, item five on the agenda is public. Uh, sorry, item four on the agenda is public questions, and I can confirm that we have received no public questions for this evening's meeting. So we move directly on to agenda item five, which is the summary general fund revenue budget. And that is included on in section B. And I will call upon the lead cabinet member for finance, Councillor John Williams, to present his report. John, over to you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, this proposed general fund revenue budget for 2021-22 has as its heart uh, giving support to South Cambridge's residents and businesses to help them recover from the co coronavirus pandemic during the coming financial year. It also has to recognise the government's local government financial settlement for the coming financial year, which in the words of the local government association, is dependent on councils increasing council tax bill. You will see from Appendix A on page 17 of the agenda supplement that the net expenditure for 2021-22 to be met from government grants and local taxpayers is estimated at £21.9 million. We are looking at council taxpayers meeting £10 million of this net expenditure with a 10% with a 10 pence a week increase for the average bandee property, bringing its annual tax council bill to £155.31. This is explained on page 11 of the agenda supplement. This will only in part offset the estimated reduction in business rate and also the assumed losses in other government grants. Nevertheless, the council tax bill from South Cambridge District Council will continue to be in the lowest 25% of all district council taxes. We have a local council tax support scheme for those on low incomes and other categories such as carers, <coughs> as well as council tax discretionary powers. 
And I'm proud of our Revs and Bens team efforts, which have kept payment defaults lower than expected. So the local council tax collection rate has held up under um, and we thank council taxpayers for maintaining their payments. Despite uncertainty of the economic situation, we expect, given our experiences so far, that this will continue into the new financial year. However, we have seen a hit on business rate income and we have concern that the long term effects of the pandemic in terms of business failures and property may impact on the business rate growth as we've seen to date. As you can see from paragraph 37 on page 10 of the agenda supplement, we are, however, continuing with the business rates retention scheme and estimate that it will deliver an additional £1 million for us, which is very welcome in the current circumstances. Against this background of less income from business rates and grants, the council is just not relying on more money from council taxpayers. To do our bit, we have embarked on an ambitious four year plan to transform council service quality, better align our financial resources to business plan priorities and improve customer service. And as you can see, this has achieved a reduction in net expenditure compared to this financial year. The financial impact of this can be found on page eight of the agenda supplement. Part of this has been to reappraise our relationship with our shared service partnership arrangements. Uh, this year, we introduced a recharge model to ensure we receive value for money and are not subsiding services in other council areas. This was a long standing concern of mine when in opposition in the previous administration. So as you can see, the estimated general fund net revenue expenditure of the council has also fallen compared to this financial year. However, not to have increased council tax by a modest amount would have still meant a funding gap, causing cuts to frontline services, which we are not prepared to do, such as our new business support and development team, which has been a lifeline to local entrepreneurs. It is anticipated that councils will be able to keep less uh, will be able to keep less than now in the years ahead. Other grants the council currently receive, such as the new homes bonus and rural services grant, are expected to be phased out. Due to the continuing financial pressure on the council, this budget should be seen within the medium term financial strategy and its requirement to include around five million pounds worth of savings during the next four years on top of the 2.2 million pounds in savings already identified for that four year period. To be honest, the recent changes to the criteria for a public works loan board loan, which now rules out commercial investment substantially for yield, does mean we will see lower returns. But, but such are the capabilities of our officers, opportunities for us and the financial strength of this council. We believe this can be dealt with in our in our stride. As to helping our communities and businesses fight back against the pandemic, we estimate that the cost of dealing with the pandemic so far has been approximately £2.35 million. Pounds. This is mainly due to increased spending on PPE, additional staff numbers to help in certain areas such as community response, processing business grants and council tax support, a new software for administrating grants. To date, the council has received £1.9 million in government grants to help it deal with increased spending due to coronavirus. If needed, this work will continue into the next financial year and possibly thereafter. So we have set aside a revenue contingency of a quarter of a million pounds. The government is also making good most of the loss of income from fees such as planning and licensing charges. It has also promised to make good up to 70% of council tax loss due to the pandemic, although we have yet to be told the formula for this. So the direct impact of COVID-19 on our costs in this financial year should be broadly neutral and should not be problematic, problematic for next year. 
as I've reported before, South Cambridgeshire is in a sound financial position and this budget gives us confidence to proceed into the next financial year to support a dynamic council with a positive agenda. Thank you. Grenville, you're muted. Thank you so much. My apologies. Uh, Councillor Williams, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I am aware that there are a number of questions which will be coming to you, um, but could I start off with uh, a fairly simple one for you under, under recommendation 3A, and it relates to the final line. We talk about an estimated gross, um, sorry, gross operating expenditure for 21, 22, 70.7 7 million. The gross operating income of 49.1. Should we therefore be talking about a net operating deficit of 21.6 million as opposed to an operating expenditure? Um. Are you referred to Appendix A, which, yeah, um, yeah and, and Appendix A gives the net expenditure as 21.879 million. And um, before then, uh, under the recommendations, point three, on page one of agenda item five, under 3A, we have um, an estimated general fund gross operating expenditure of 70.727 million, gross operating income of 49.1 million, and an estimated general fund net operating expenditure of 21.6. My question is, should that read general fund net deficit of 21.6 million? Well, it's not exactly a deficit because it'd be made up from taxation from local taxation and government grants. So it is a, it is it is the operating expenditure of the council given that the council has to balance its books okay you're happy to leave it as so uh, i'm happy to leave that as it is that's fine thank you okay. um, and I, I now see that councillor de Lacey would like to come in thank you chairman <clears throat> i'm not very good at numbers uh but i have three questions if i may uh on page 19 of the um the, the uh, paper on uh, item five uh, at the bottom it says commercial development and investment it has been necessary to review the size and composition of the investment team um, when we were given the various figures for our investments uh, we were told how much money uh, we were going to get out of these various investments we're now spending more on the team uh, which I suppose on one level is a good thing because it indicates there's a lot of work to be done. But I wonder how much that £76,000 uh, per annum eats into the income that our investments were supposed to, to accrue. That, that's my first question. Mm -hmm. My second question is on page 20. It's not page I can't read my own writing, I beg your pardon. 29. Um, well, that's not right either. I'll, I'll leave the, my second question until I can find it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> my third question on page 30, though, um, uh, reserves number two, you have two figures of pounds star star dot star. Yeah. And I wonder if we could have those figures filled in, please, uh, while I desperately search for my second question. OK, so on your last question, I, I know Peter Maddock is, is here. I don't know if we've got those figures. We, we now have those figures. We certainly didn't have those figures earlier, but um, which is why they're not there. But uh, Peter might be able to supply them on, on your first question. I mean, that 76,000 additional uh, for uh, will, will be um, obviously spread across our investments, the cost of our investments and actually in the scheme of things represents quite a, a, a small amount. 
of money, so it's not going to have an impact on our anticipated yield going forward. I mean, one of, one of the reasons um, for for this is, as you know, um, we are ent we we we've agreed to have um, partnerships, and as a result of that, um, things are much more complicated, and we require that additional expertise to enable us to help us um, with with those uh, with those partnership um, schemes, but. Um, yeah, I don't know. I say I don't know if, uh, if Peter Maddock has those figures. Um, sorry, yeah, I don't have them to hand. They weren't available when the budget was um, was um, put together, but um, we will have the figures now. So um, I will get hold of those figures and I will, I will send them on. Thank you. We really. certainly have them when it comes to cabinet. Look, yeah, we, we uh, yeah. So um, the, the cabinet agenda will have those numbers in. Um, off the top of my head, I think certainly the, the uh, reserves, the um, earmark reserve balance, I believe, is about 29 million. So the general fund will make up the, the remaining two, uh, what is it, 12, 13 million? Yes. So There's about 13 and a half general fund and about 29 earmark reserves. I believe that's what the numbers are. That's sort of ballpark. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Chairman. If I may ask my third question. Yes, um, it's page 23, managing demand better. And I'm slightly surprised that our wonderful new electric um, waste vehicle doesn't figure. I assume part of buying it is that it is actually value for money as well as being um, a, a wonderful investment for uh, both the staff and for our, um, our ecology generally. I, I understand it's on revenue terms, it's cost neutral, isn't it, Peter? Yeah, so the um, the actual expenditure shows within the capital program rather than the revenue budget. So it won't appear in those tables. So it'll appear in a different table within the, the capital program. So the vehicle's operating costs are broadly uh, similar those, to yeah. a, a conventionally, yeah, conventionally powered vehicle. We, yeah. we believe so, yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor De Lacey. I'm Councillor Anna Bradnam. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Bradnam. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, my question also is on um, page 19, um, and that page is uh, entitled New Revenue Budget Bids, Staff Related. Um, I'm assuming that because the count, this is simply my understanding of it, I'm assuming that given that these bud bids have been made to the revenue budget, there's no question that they won't be, um, I mean, we're recommending that they uh, are agreed, presumably, that these posts are necessary and proper, appropriate for the work that's being described. Yes, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that they are, are needed and uh, are happy that they go forward to cabinet for um, their their approval, uh, but, but the, the the approval rests with cabinet. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, Councillor Graham Cohn next. Um, thank you. Thanks very much, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to ask um, a couple of questions. One was on page seven. I weren't sure um, in the chart under paragraph twenty five whether the millions should still be at the top of the. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's just a typo, I think, potentially. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, and obviously, our, we, we seem to be getting a, a lot less investment um, income from investment this year. Could you just sort of explain the, the reasons behind that? Uh, you know, obviously, there's some very obvious ones, I, I would have thought, in terms of COVID and everything else. But if you could just expand on that a little bit. And then on page um, 20 of the uh, document, I was going to ask about the um, uh, commercial development and investment operational costs. I didn't really know what that um, what that 50,000 was paying for there. So if you could have a look at that as well for me, that'd be brilliant. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, well, OK, if I can pick up on that last point, clearly before we um, look at any um, any properties, um, we, we have to do um, a due diligence and we have to get our um, agents to give us their opinions on whether or not um, it's um, commercially worthwhile and give, will give us the yield. Um, and we have to pay, you know, in advance for that. It cannot be attributed to the um, cost of purchasing, the eventual purchasing of that property, whether or not we go ahead with it. So that, so that, so there are operational costs involved in, in us considering, um, you know, properties for, for, for purchasing, for, for commercial purchase. Um, on your, um, on your first question about um, reduced spending on investment income, I mean, clearly um, we haven't, our investment programme has been affected by COVID and it has not gone, um, you know, and we haven't invested as much as we thought we were going to invest this financial year because of that. So, you know, there is, there is therefore, uh, um, you know, a, um, a reduction on what we expect to be um, um, spending on on investment income. <laughs> really down to the you know, down to the, the, the difficult circumstances we find ourselves in this year, and um, and just that the properties have not been there for us to um, for us to purchase. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Cain. Did you wish to come back on that, or are you content? No, very content. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Chair, Peter Maddock had his hand up. Thank I don't you. know oh, if right. he wants to butt in, step in. Peter. Well, I was just going to add a bit of context there because um, most of the reduction is due to delays with um, Ermine Street. So when we um, had the first lockdown in particular, um, a lot of the activity uh, with Ermine Street uh, dried up for a period of time. Um, and whilst we were hoping to get to the 500 property mark this financial year, that's now going to be next financial year. So uh, the interest on Ermine Street is down on our original expectation. So that's the main reason. That's helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor uh, Richard Williams is next, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Richard Williams. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I've got a question uh, relating to page 23. Um, and this relates to the increase in the charge for the green bin. So in the green box, um, second line, so well, A, 10A. Um, it, it looks like we're, we're kind of assuming that the, the increase in the charge won't actually affect demand for that because we've got 19,000 um, for uh, the three years. Um, so I was just wondering if any work had been done as to whether we think the increase in the charge, which would be about 40%, I think, or um, just over 40% over the three years, is likely to affect um, demand for that. I mean, either up or down, really, but uh, it just looks like we've assumed demand won't change. Our um, our colleagues in in, in waste um, are pretty, you know, certain that um, we, we won't see a fall off in, in demand for these green bins, even with this increase. Um, you know, it is, it is, it is a modest increase set across the year. It reflects um, what other councils are charging and um, all the evidence we is suggests to us that we won't see um, a, a, a lessening in demand for for additional green bins as a result of this increase in charge. Thank you. Councillor Williams, are you content or did you wish to have a follow up? Um, well, well, I'm just wondering if we've got any figures about previous increases and whether whether they or indeed when the charge was introduced, what what impact that had. Well, well, I mean, you might not have the, the figures now. But well, the well introducing the charge actually yeah. increased the number of green bins. Um, we actually saw demand go up for green bins when we increased the charge because a lot of people weren't aware that they could get a second green bin. So uh, um, even with the charge, people actually not more people came to us and wanted a second green bin, even though we were charging for that. So I think that 
sort of shows that it's pretty inelastic demand at the moment for, for green bins. I think you either have the garden rubbish or you don't and you need to get rid of it. So you, you get you, you, you get an extra bin. Yeah, thank you. My, my point was only that we, we sort of looked into this and we thought about the, the, the likely impact rather than just assumed it would stay. Oh, no, no, we have. We, oh, have, we, have, looked at it. we have looked at it, Richard. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Uh, Councillor Claire Dalton. Uh, thank you, Chairman. It's just a point of clarification, please. On page 10, um, section 38, the Rural Services Grant. Um, it's been confirmed that it was going to continue um, into 21-22 before being phased out. Is the phasing out directly related to the fair funding review? Um, no, it's not, but I understand from the LGA um, that it, the government's going to go out to consult on, on it, on whether or not it should continue. So um, it may not be phased out but we have obviously always have to make the bad the worst case scenario assumption on these things and and that's why we we've assumed it will be phased out but as i say I've, i read in the last very latest magazine from the lga that actually the government are consulting on on the future of the of, of the grant okay. thank you chairman thank you um councillor uh, councillor anna bradman Thank you, Chairman, um, and thank you for letting me come back a second time. Um, it just reminded me, um, on page 20 in the summary of new ongoing funding bids, um, I'm very glad to see uh, that we've um, allocated £50,000 for land drainage, uh, and it refers to that as the allocation of additional funding for land drainage, including gullies, watercourse and flood defence works, which I'm sure everyone's extremely glad to see is in there. But I just wanted to check, is that work on award drains only or uh, or indeed where South Kansas District Council is the landowner? Or are we finding ourselves having to do work on drains that are not our responsibility? I'll um, have to come back to you on that, councillor. I I've assumed it's on awarded water courses, but um, we, I, I don't know. I don't know if Peter knows, but might have to come. We'll have to come back to you on that. I think. Thank you very much. That would be fine. Thank you. That's helpful. And finally, um, Chair, we've got Councillor Harvey. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Thank you. Yes. Jeff. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I would just, um, if I may, um, refer back to. I thought it's a very interesting point, um, Councillor De Lacey made that um, you know that obviously there are um, sort of overhead costs involved in in, in sort of running a uh, investment operation. And I suppose um, I haven't actually. I wish I'd now had saved all the previous scrutiny papers because I'd be able to look back and see if um, when we looked at potential acquisitions um, last year whether the um, yield was including an allowance for the, you know, a, a pro rata um, part of the cost of running the whole operation. Um, and if not, whether now we've got a bit more experience um, in this, um, whether in future we, we could sort of um, see, I mean, I, I take the point that it's kind of small beer compared with the, the size of the investment and its return, but nevertheless, it's, it's still something. And I suppose um, one really should be um, seeing what the sort of um, returns are net of those costs in order to be able to compare, um, for example, what Ermin Street is um, generating versus commercial investment versus, um, you know, green, whatever. It would be quite interesting. Um, and apologies if you're, you're not going to tell me that, that we were told that information before. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think we were, but as you say, the uh, amount of money involved and given that it has to be spread over um, it's a very, very difficult thing to um, to account for or because it will totally depend on the number of commercial transactions that you undertake and obviously the more for the first commercial transaction all the cost will be put on that but obviously as you go on and make more commercial the, the cost that is 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 full between each so it's really difficult at any point in time to us to um, um, 
associate a cost to your um, to, to your uh, purchase. Um, and probably the better way of doing it is to have this cost in the in the budget, you know, in the on the balance sheet, but not actually against the yield itself. You see what I'm, where I'm coming from? Because otherwise, yes. what yeah. what figure can you attribute? It depends on how many schemes you end up managing. And at, at the time of a particular scheme, you don't know how many more schemes are going to be managed. So it's not very easy to approach it. Clearly, once we have bought a property and we need work doing on it, then the then the cost of the of 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 that is attributed to the to the cost of the of the scheme. For example, 270 Cambridge Science Park, the cost of the project to um, to um, renovate that and and repurpose it is included in the cost of doing it, but the actual cost of administering the rents, for example, isn't for the very reason I've just explained. It would be extremely difficult to do that. Mm. Uh, that's a yes. good explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Did you wish to follow up, Councillor Harvey? No, I. Um, thank you, Chair. No, I agree with Councillor Williams that it, it would be very difficult uh, yes. to track. Um, but. Um, you might have you might have one acquisition during the year, or you might have. Yes, some. that is the problem. So how, do you, how do you apportion uh, it? That's yeah. A, yeah. A okay. Thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think I see Councillor Cathcart with his hand. Yeah. Down. Thank you. I've got trouble with my computer, but um, uh, just a couple of things on specific cost items, uh, and I think um, uh, Gavin Clay's already been discussing this with Peter Maddock. That I think it'd be helpful, really, in the uh, context of giving as much help to our constituents as possible during this crisis ongoing, whether some sort of support officer could be considered uh, to provide advice and help, uh, financial and otherwise, on the grants and everything, and the and and what might be available, not just from this council, but throughout the uh, the whole spectrum, because a lot of people have great difficulty, especially those who are badly affected by personal circumstances, have great difficulty acce accessing what's actually available. And it might, in fact, in a sense, save money if we actually considered having such an officer to actually provide support uh, for those who need it throughout district. Clearly, such support would need to be targeted and it would have to be clearly accessible. It's no good having an officer that no one in, knows is actually there. So it's something that we could all consider, I think, as a, as a sort of constructive, humane and uh, and sort of realistic possibility. Uh, the other one we might consider is the uh, oh, the zero carbon grants. Last year, the money ran out at 100,000. Uh, and I'm wondering whether there's some scope for actually increasing it this year. It may well be there very deep in the figures. I don't know, uh, but it's a relatively modest amount. And it's something that's uh, consistent with our policies. So I think that's something um, uh, that we can actually uh, look at constructively. And the third one, being on this council as long as I have, I remember years ago we used to give conservation grants for a whole range of activities that was highly effective um, and actually provide a lot of help as well as uh, uh, ensuring high levels of traffic, a whole range of things. And it may well be possible to consider that degree of support because it's been apparent to me that conservation as an issue has actually uh, uh, not as high a profile as it used to be. Now I fully recognise that there are priorities but I think conservation could be considered somewhere along the line. So there are three possibilities. I think the emergent one is the one I mentioned uh, first about actually having a support officer. In fact. So anyway, I think Peter, Peter Manick may have a, any comments on that or I don't really know. Um, just before um, anyone does come in, Councillor Cathcart, can I just ask, I, I had an indication that uh, Councillor Clayton was actually going to present an amendment or propose right. an amendment along those lines. Right, OK. Um, ca can I uh, check with Councillor Clayton whether that is the case? And if so, perhaps he'd like to um, introduce his amendment to the budget. Councillor Clayton. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, 
that that is the case. Um, I do have an amendment. I don't. Do you have a copy of it? Do, do the scrutiny committee members have a copy of it, or do you want me to read? Um, well, I'm, I was going to ask um, Democratic Services if it, if it's possible to put a copy of the proposed amendment up on the screen, please. Yeah, sure, Chairman. Um, just bear with me a second, and Thanks. I shall share my screen. There you have it. Councillor Clayton, over to you. OK, so um, I wanted to first of all, thank you for giving me the, the, the space of scrutiny to, to raise this amendment and thank you to, to Peter for the for the budget briefing, which in fact raised this as a possibility in, in my mind um, back in November, I believe it was. Um, I just wanted to say I think I think this adds to the intent expressed by Councillor Williams in terms of uh, supporting South Cam's residents during the recovery from COVID. Um, it, it comes directly from a piece from a piece of casework that I did here in Camborne, and I think it represents a very modest addition to the budget, which I'll come on to. Um, and it also helps us fulfil South Cam's district council values as expressed within the mission statement, etc., on, on the website and within all our corporate documents. Um, I think it also plans a proactive approach to um, to the mit to mitigation of, of, of impact of recession and depression that that's going to emerge over the coming financial year. Um, so it, it came out of some casework where residents in Campbell were issued with court orders and it, it, uh, which compounded the, the debt that they were trying to deal with and also health mental health addiction issues that, that, that that particular family had at the time and through actually a really brief intervention from myself you know a, a couple of emails and a couple of phone calls actually the court orders were lifted the situation was clarified and actually just prior to Christmas the pressure that was on that family and the stress and, um, and discomfort and you know, mental health impacts that were, were, were affecting them were lifted completely just prior to Christmas. And it was a relatively simple intervention. At that point, I thought, well, if there was an officer who could do that job, um, not that obviously casework is part of what we do, right, as councillors, I get that. But if there was a, an officer in post that could address these complex cases and, and meet with people uh, and discuss their situation, it would be, a, a, like I say, a good move. And I think that's borne out by um, reports from the Citizens Advice Bureau that talked about the compounding of debt that's brought about through the, the sometimes quite punitive uh, impact of you know, late payments producing the, a demand for the full amount within a matter of weeks, um, which, which again, as I say, it, it, it ramps up the pressure and the stress on those families. Um, I think as a as a as we express a modern and a caring council um, that no no other resident should go through what that family went just through just prior to Christmas. It was it, um, it was it felt very cruel actually bottom line from my perspective it felt like a very cruel situation and I think um, a high quality service in this area requires somebody who is mobile uh, and can actually approach people very directly, proactively, um, and, and again, address these very complex uh, situations that, that families can find themselves in. And when they're under that sort of stress, they can't respond through the normal channels. And, and maybe the letters pile up on the, on the sideboard in the hall rather than being responded to. And if, there's a, if there was a role there to, to, to respond to that, it could help. And I think a proposal of a modest uh, amount around about 35,000 a year, hopefully for a couple of years. So actually the evaluation and the evidence of the impact of that role can be collected over a reasonable length of time and, and perhaps show that not only does it have a, a human impact, as, as, as Councillor Cathcart suggested, but it's a humane intervention and a humane role, but actually it could end up saving the council money, stop people getting into the sorts of debt that I think is going to become more apparent with the end of furlough in March. We could see a spike in redundancies, business closures, and we need to plan and be as responsive as we possibly can. 
Um, so I'll, I'll just briefly finish. Yeah, absolutely. I'm right on my last my last sentence, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, so in the same way that we provide a lifeline to local entrepreneurs through business support teams, I think it would be really well advised if we can also um, uh, construct a lifeline for our most vulnerable citizens in the year ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think we should discuss this um, proposal prior to uh, deciding on the general revenue budget overall. Can I, um, so, do can I, a, um, can I sort of cut short maybe the debate and say that I am happy to accept this amendment. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that we have set up a quarter of a million contingency fund. Um, this this particular new post will be is certainly linked to our, as I said earlier, our efforts to support our residents and businesses with um, the pandemic and um, and the aftermath of the pandemic. So I am very happy to accept uh, Councillor Clayton's um, amendment um, and to um, to proceed with this on on a, as as Councillor Clayton has said, you know, on a on a limited basis. Um, and then we can assess to see whether or not there is a need uh, for for this post following uh, following the um, the pandemic, the, the the effects of the pandemic. So um, so I hope that might um, shorten the debate on this. Indeed, that's very helpful. <laughs> thank, you very, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, could, could I ask, are there in, in the view of the fact that that uh, proposal has been accepted? Can I ask, are there any other a proposed amendments to the budget, please. Do I see that Councillor Heather Williams wishes to uh, speak? We move in Conservative Amendment, an appropriate point. Mm -hmm. Councillor Heather Williams, are you there? Thank you, Chairman. Um, and can I, with, with your discretion, just say um, that um, I'm very pleased that uh, Councillor Clayton's uh, amendments being supported by the administration. I think what he's highlighted is, is important and I'm pleased to hear that's gone through. Um, I have supplied um, a copy of an amendment. Um, good start. Uh, my amendment via Peter I'm not sure if it made its way to Victoria. I'm looking at Peter's. Um, I have got a copy. Um, Councillor yeah. Williams, I received it just before the meeting, so I can share it on the screen if you'll give me a few seconds. Thank you very much, Victoria. Um, so by way of introduction, those of us that sit on planning force, uh, planning committee will see that um, in our enforcement report that we've received recently, it's been clear that um, something that we wouldn't normally see um, is, is occurring. Uh, our completion rates and enforcement rates are lower um, and that signals to me that uh, a team that has normally performed, you know, historically ex extremely well um, could do with some more support. So with that in mind, um, the Conservative group would like to propose that we establish an extra planning enforcement officer under a permanent contract that be permanent support and that this could be funded um, by reducing the South Cambridgeshire magazine to two copies a year rather than four and by the removal of two of the second special responsibility allowance. You'll um, recall members I'm sure that we used to have only one SRA, we now have two um, where applicable and that is the tune of £13,500. I would propose that we remove that second SRA, reduce the magazine and fund extra planning enforcement support. Um, I hope that um, the figures are, are all there and uh, members can see that it's been fully costed. Um, and uh, happy to take any questions from yourself, Chairman or committee members. Thank you. Do you, do you have a second for that proposal? Um, my understanding, Chairman, is that the scrutiny will are to to look through. We will then move actually move the amendment at the budget meeting in February. 
Okay, thank you very much. And um, Chair, there were two people lined up to speak. We've got Councillor Hawkins as planning lead and um, Councillor Anna Bradnam, who might want to speak on the previous amendment. Oh, my apologies, Councillor Bradnam, if I missed you out on the previous one. Uh, thank you, you Chairman. Are, you are next in line. Did, did you wish to speak on this? Yes, well, I wanted to speak on um, the motion proposed by Councillor Clayton. Um, the first thing was, did you actually need a seconder for his motion, given that Councillor Williams has accepted it? Uh, so that's uh, one thing. Um, no, I don't think I do. In view of the fact that Councillor Williams has accepted it, I don't think there's any need for it. OK, fine. Um, thank you. And the second thing was, um, I'm glad that that's been accepted, um, but can I just point out to members that don't forget that the County Council provides community navigators who do very much this sort of work um, through the care network community. And um, I can provide a, a telephone number for people needing that service in South Cams if people wish it. So, so just to remember that there is a, commu a county community navigator for all of the areas that we cover. Thank you. I have to say, Chair, that doesn't they don't perform the same role that's intended for this post. Um, my understanding is that they do. Sorry, through you, Chairman. That they, they offer um, um, direction towards sources of advice, including financial. So uh, I take your point, Councillor Williams. It was just to just so that members remember that there is a county service to yeah that's very helpful thank you very much indeed thank you thank you councillor williams uh, can i come to councillor Jimmy hawkins please uh, good evening good evening chairman thank you very much and good evening members um if i may through you chair to speak to the uh proposal from councillor heather williams um, I would like to thank her very much for uh, the thought that went into her proposal. Um, but I think what I'd like to say is that the proposal actually at this point in time uh, is not necessary because as of today, uh, we have actually gone out to recruitment. Uh, this was something that we couldn't do before, uh, but we are now able to do. And um, we will be recruiting for two positions, one of which is to backfill the position that um, became vacant when we lost um, Mr. Trotter. And the other one for the uh, long standing um, position that we had when the reorganization of the um, planning service took place. So I can assure her that as of today, um, we are already out for recruitment and therefore I'd like to thank her for this, but to say that it will not be required. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Williams, it sounds as though you get your wish without having to uh, cut back any on uh, uh, cut back on the uh, particular funding measures you proposed. Chairman, if I if I may respond to the question. Thank you. So um this is extra planning support. So I mean, fantastic news that we're back filling for the posts that are empty. Um, but the idea of this was to provide more support and more robust, not just get us up to the standards that we normally expect and we've been back filling from. Um, I'd also just like to have clarification that I think even if even if we have um, these two positions filled, I would like to see the enforcement team be expanded more and further because we do have big issues and my ward in particular has has a lot of enforcement issues and the residents feel that these matters they struggle to resolve these and I can understand with the resources that we had. Um, I'd also like clarification though I, I appreciate that the proposal is myself putting it forward ahead of a uh, full council that the extra position is a permanent long standing because my understanding is it would only be for a year contract, whereas what we want to see is permanent reinforcement of the planning enforcement support with long term funding. Thank you. 
Um, Councillor Peter Fain has asked to speak. So, Councillor Fain. Thank you, Chair. I think, like a lot of members, I have been concerned about the pressure on the enforcement team. So, while I support the the principle of this, I'm very much reassured that the um, filling of the vacancies should meet that. I would have thought we should see how that goes before coming back to the question, perhaps at a later date, of whether an additional enforcement officer um, is taken on. Chairman, I would have concerns about reducing the frequency of the magazine. It's a useful source of information to uh, to all parishioners, to all our uh, council taxpayers. And the danger is that if it becomes twice a year, it loses that continuity. People no longer rely on it as something that is sufficiently up to date to tell them about council services. I think that would be a loss. Uh, I don't, I'm not an expert on the SRAs. I won't comment on that aspect of it, but I think the two elements can be separated uh, of this motion because um, it looks as though the planning enforcement team will be reinforced or brought back to its previous strength anyway without this amendment. Thank you, Peter. Um, I uh, think Chair, we have two more speakers, I think. Um, Peter Maddock on the Labour amendment and um, Councillor Toomey Hawkins back on the Conservative amendment. Thanks, Judith. So can I come to, P to Peter Maddock first of all, please? Peter. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just to say that um, assuming everyone's happy with the Labour amendment, if um, officers work with Councillor Clayton and uh, Councillor John Williams to bring forward a proposal to put in the budget, is um, the members be happy with that? Yes, I'm sure they will. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, to come back to uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Um, when the planning service was reorganised, the service was reorganised in a way that um, the workload that we expected, um, each group was sized accordingly. And uh, the fact that we were not able to fill the positions that were available, um, as we know, we do have issues with uh, you know, planning and enforcement officer recruitment. It is, it is a national issue. Um, but we have come a long way and we will be doing that. And the size of the team as it is, uh, is what was deemed sufficient to be able to do the work. Now, I think when it comes to, uh, re <laughs> um, you know, deciding uh, the, the requirement of uh, planning teams, it will be helpful perhaps if uh, Councillor Williams had actually discussed this um, with us beforehand. And as I said, while I appreciate uh, the concerns that have been expressed, it will be, as you've heard uh, Councillor Finn said, it will be best for us to actually get what we have, uh, what we have planned for, work with that, and if we do find we need more, then we will go out to get more. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think in actual fact, um, you will have time to discuss this matter with uh, Councillor Williams between now and the budget meeting a full council when I presume it will be then that this uh, motion will be tabled and debated in full. Am I right, Councillor Williams? Assuming you meet myself, Chairman, as there are yes, three I'm of us sorry. on the call. Councillor Heather Williams. Um, yes. Gets very confusing around here these days. Um, yes, I mean, the constitution requires that any budget proposal come through scrutiny, which is what we are doing. The budget um, amendment will then be moved and debated at full council as full council agrees the budget um, going forward. So um, I welcome the opportunity to discuss it I've, um, with Councillor Hawkins if she so wishes and wants to organise a meeting, uh, but there is no requirement for me to do so. The opportunity here is for members of you know, ahead of scrutiny. Um, this is the opportunity for scrutiny members to contact, um, make comments on the quality of the information um, ahead of full council. So the chairman, I, I look forward to any further conversations that, that the cabinet wish to have with me, but yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Refreshing. 
I see we have an, another speaker in Councillor Martin Khan. Martin. Um, so, yes, I just simply wanted to uh, add reinforcement to what uh, Councillor Fain was saying. Um, it seems since we are filling the two posts, uh, not perhaps the best time to uh, make an assessment to whether the additional uh, enforcement officer is needed. Um, it, it may well be needed, but uh, I, I would have thought that this is something after the experience of a year will be found, first of all, whether we can actually appoint to the recruitment officers in view of the difficulties of recruiting officers. Uh, uh, and when we see how it happens in practice, uh, that, that will be the time to um, debate whether we actually need a permanent, uh, a permanent change on this basis. Um, so that, that's, um, that's what I would comment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Khan. And uh, I, I think we can actually remove the uh, screen share now, if you would, please, Victoria. We can go back to uh, actually seeing everyone. Um, Councillor Richard Williams, you wish to speak? Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Um, um, just, just to say, uh, well, actually, I've got a procedural question and, 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 and some substantive comments. Um, I'll start with the, the, the comments. I mean, just to say I, I actually support for myself both of the amendments. I think the Labour amendment's a very good amendment. Um, I also support the Conservative amendment. Um, I, I think the funding difference between the two is, is, is fine, is, is explicable. The Conservative you know, proposal is, is, has got some costings in it. The Labour one hasn't, but that, that I think is quite right, given the context. Um, and given what the lead member for finance has said about how that can be um, authorised. I mean, for my part, just to give the, the counter view, um, I, I don't think great harm would be done by cutting the magazine to twice a year. There are lots and lots and lots of ways that we have um, of, of giving information to residents, the website being one of them. Um, so um, to my mind, it seems um, a reasonable and proportionate um, way of, of funding this, given the problems that I think as Councillor Fain has acknowledged, we all we all see with enforcement and the lack of enforcement action um, for various reasons, um, um, but it can be very frustrating to um, residents. So, so I do support both amendments. Just on the procedural question, um, Chair, I'm, I'm just a little bit confused as to what the, the process is, um, dating back to the question whether we needed um, seconders for motions. I, um, given that we're not actually amending the budget here, um, I, I just welcome a bit of clarity as to what how we actually deal with these amendments, whether we have to vote on them or whether we just. How <laughs> what will we actually do with these amendments? I think the full um, discussion and the debate on these will come in full council in a few weeks time. Um, if you look at the recommendations on page one of agenda item five, which is Annex B, we are requested to consider and comment on the report that invites cabinet on its at its meeting on the 3rd of February 2021 to uh, consider points A to K. Um, I think we've probably fulfilled our responsibility in that respect. Uh, we have made a number of we've asked a number of questions. We've clarified a number of points um, in respect of the uh, Labour proposal. Councillor Williams has accepted that. Um, I presume Councillor Williams in, in relation to the second amendment, uh, the Conservative one, you are not accepting that at this stage. And if that no, is in, 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 in view of um, Councillor Hawkins um, response, no, I'm not accepting it. No, I understand. Um, so that therefore will have to go forward for debate at full council, uh, taking into account the uh, questions and the comments that have been made here in the scrutiny committee uh, and with that I think that um, draws this the discussion on the general fund revenue to a, a conclusion. Can I um, can I just uh, just say Chair, I'm conscious that there were two points from Councillor Cathcart that I didn't respond to. <laughs> um, we went off into the um, into the officer uh, into the officer post and uh, didn't cover the two other um, questions Councillor Cathcart put to me. One was to do with the Zero Carbon Fund yeah. and um, that's funded from the Renewables Fund and you'll see um, that we actually are moving money into the Renewables Fund um, but it is up to the Climate Committee to decide how much yeah. it wants to spend on the uh, Zero Carbon Fund going forward yeah. and clearly um, they would make a recommendation to me um, to see whether or not um, it was reasonable to increase the size of that fund um, 
for for next um, year. But um, the assumption has been that for next financial year, um, the the amount of money available for the zero carbon fund would be as it is this year. Um, on to uh, conservation um, grants. Um, I have to say this must go back a long way, Councillor <laughs> Clark, because I don't really remember these grants. I've been on the council for over yeah. <laughs> well, I can, um, over yeah. ten years, but never mind. Um, it's certainly something I think it's worth looking at. But again, you know, this yeah. is for this is for um, another committee to look at and to make a recommendation, maybe for for the um, 21, 22. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, sorry, can I just come and speak very briefly? Then? Yes, it, it was a there was a grant scene for um, listed buildings, buildings and conservation areas, or for maintaining good standards of traditional workmanship in our villages, and it was highly successful because for a relatively small amount of money, we did actually encourage uh, an awful lot of good building tradesmen to actually um, uh, do a much better standard of work than might otherwise have been the case. It's just something to be borne in mind uh, because it disappeared. It must have been 15 years ago now. So we oh, need yeah, to well, look before my time then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we need to look and to see and to sort of bring it back at some stage to see whether there's some scope for actually having a look at that again, because our, our villages uh, are under considerable threat from developers of all sorts. So we need to maintain good standards of craftsmanship and workmanship in our villages. That's what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, with that, uh, members, I'd like to move on, if we may, to agenda item six, which is the housing revenue account, revenue and capital budget, which for those of you who have uh, separated your payments, this is in section C. And I will once again call upon yeah. Councillor John Williams, the lead cabinet member for finance, to introduce the report. Councillor yeah. Williams, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, firstly, I should remind you that the housing revenue account has to be ring fenced from the general fund of the council. In other words, broadly speaking, we cannot subsidise house, council housing from local taxation and the resource available for investing in our housing is dependent upon the income streams available to the HRA. Uh, the HRA budget continues to be set in the context of a 30 year business plan. We must also remember that the HRA has to support a housing debt of £205 million, which are loans from the Public Works Loan Board to enable us to retain all of our council rents from the government. We estimate the HRA balance at the end of this financial year will be just over two and a half million pounds. And while this is adequate for HRA purposes, it would not be prudent to let it fall much below that figure. Appendix B on page 25 of the agenda supplement shows how we are addressing this going forward. There is therefore no alternative to increasing council rent levels if we are to maintain our drive to improve the customer service to our tenants and grow our social housing stock. Rents will increase by 1.5% and this means that the average social rent will increase to £106 and 2 pence per week. And in line with rent legislation, our affordable rents will continue to be no more than 80% of the market rent. We are acutely aware that some of our tenants are having financial problems. Paragraph 21 on page 5 of the agenda supplement explains that because of the pandemic, current council rent arrears have increased significantly in percentage terms. However, the introduction of the new Orchard Housing Management System should allow for targeted review of tenants arrears and collections. And we anticipate that this position will improve as we emerge from the pandemic. The HRA budget also includes support for tenants, some of whom are receiving universal credit. As to the council house building program, we have external funding from section 106 community sums, retained to write high, buy to, sorry, retained right to buy receipts, and how we utilise these funds is identified in the Housing Capital Investment Plan. I'm sure Councillor Hazel Smith, lead member uh, for housing, who is with us, um, can elaborate further on this. I will therefore ask you to support this HRA budget, which delivers the financial base to support our ambitious building programme 
and a service to our tenants um, that is fit uh, for purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Williams. Um, first to speak is Councillor Claire Dornton. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's a question about which relates to paragraph 56 on page 10. Um, and that concerns the work that needs to be done as a result of the Brentfall fire. Um, and so I'm just wondering if um, there's separate monies set aside for that or whether the work described in paragraph 56 is shown um, amalgamated into the table at Appendix C, page 27. Because I know that in some cases those are quite major changes to um, buildings. OK, uh, on this one, I'll have to ask um, Mr Maddox if he can respond to that. Peter, can you can you help? On that one, please. Yes, <clears throat> so um, with regard to um, our um, repairs and maintenance programme and our capital programme, all, all of all of the costs, additional costs in relation to Grenfell and um, and that will be within the program as it currently stands. So we haven't got anything specially set aside. Right. So we will fund it from our our ongoing reserve. So so we have a uh, we have a major repairs reserve uh, that can fund uh, things like this. But we haven't got anything specifically set aside. It would just come from our our general HRA and our major repairs balance. OK, I, I, I suppose I'm particularly thinking about the areas where we have blocks of flats and whether um, the refurbishments there are related to Grenfell, but um, I'm, I'm happy with that reply. I just didn't see a separate entry marked Grenfell on the list in Appendix C, but I understand why. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Cohn, Councillor Graham Cohn. Thanks very much, Chairman. Um, I've just got a, a few points on uh, page six of the um, document um, uh, at the top of page six, where we talk about the sort of uh, properties that are the 89 properties that are sitting void. I just wondered if we had a KPI on how long properties are um, sitting void for. Um, I accept that the figure in, in here is a reasonable one, um, given, you know, crossover between people moving in and out of properties, but I just wondered if we had a KPI on that. Um, and the the other one was on page seven, seven paragraph 35, and um, the freed up space um, that we um, get from uh, demolition of garages uh, owned and rented out by the council, is it possible for us to stipulate that it must be social housing that goes on to those um, uh, plots of land um, and the, the the last one that I had was on page four um, it was my um, not understanding it as well as I should do really and um, the the table under paragraph 16 alludes to the fact that we've um, so like the first line at the top there we've gone up by 31 33 houses um, so I just wondered how they've been funded. So 30% would have come from the right to buy receipts, I, I'd have thought. Um, and the other 70%, how, how are we funding that? Is that from rents or is that from other sources of income? Right. Councillor Williams, over to you. Um, yeah, I don't know if Councillor Hazel Smith wants to uh, come in here on, on some of these points. Councillor Smith, a warm welcome to you, first of all. Would you wish to address the meeting? Thank you, Councillor Chamberlain. Um, yes. The the KPI, there is a KPI for um, length of void. Um, and um, we know that that uh, that is in the red because um, properties were taking a long time earlier in the year. Um, we are catching up. We have been catching up, um, but um, there are there are quite a lot of properties that are still um, in the process of of um, the work that Mears does on empty properties. And in fact, um, we 
we had previously put some of these out with a different contractor and we're going to do a bit more of that to try and get these numbers down. So um, so that's what I can report on on the um, paragraph 25. Um, on on the um, redevelopment of garage sites, um, you talked about um, whether um, they could be social housing. I think if if we're talking about doing those, they are quite difficult to develop because um, there is a reason why they were garage sites in the first place. They've usually got something quite difficult underneath the ground and so they they are not easy to develop as we've discovered when we we've looked at um, the garage sites that we have. So um, if if they were easy to develop, we could possibly do that, but it isn't our policy to do so. Um, we, we will be looking to make them um, very fuel efficient because obviously they will be our own design from the start rather than the Section 106 properties that we have been adding to our council house stock up until now. So um, there will be opportunities there. Um, the uh, sorry, what was the third question? Uh, yeah, it was just on um, paragraph 16, um, or just a point of clarification, because that the housing numbers have gone up on most of those lines, on the right. first one they're up yes. by 33. Um, I just wondered how we're paying for those. Obviously 30% will be coming from the, the receipts, I guess, but, and then, but the other 70% right where's... Right to buy receipts goes into that. And, and and the capital funding that we have carried forward. So um, some of some of that is funded by um, the surplus on the rent account, but we we have other capital monies that we can put into it as well. Okay, thank you. Grendel. I'm sorry. Um, thank you. I have no other speakers on the, on this report. Uh, can I take it therefore that uh, we have fulfilled our the request that we consider and comment on the report that invites cabinet at its meeting on third of February um, to consider recommendations A through to G. Is everyone content? Agreed. Thank you very much indeed. So can we move on then to uh, item seven on the uh, agenda, which is the Treasury Management Strategy, and that takes us back to the main section A on pages 11 to 54. And once again, I'm going to invite Councillor John Williams, the lead member for finance, to introduce the report. Thank you, Chair. Well, we're nearly there. <laughs> um, every year we now review a suite of documents in accordance with best practice to ensure we keep up to date with the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy Rules. This year's update is especially important because it takes into account the changes around the borrowing rules for the Public Works Loan Board, which came into effect from the 26th of November. To enable you to quickly see the changes that we are making, um, the, uh, these are marked in, in red ink. Although this is an opportunity to review the whole document, I will focus on the changes in red. You will see that as well as changes to the PWLB uh, borrowing rules, we also should have regard as a responsible investor to the step for um, take account of environmental, social and governance considerations as well. I expect your main concern will be the changes to the Public Works Loan Board borrowing rules. These are explained in paragraph 8.12 uh, on page 27 of the agenda pack. Basically, if we are to borrow from the PWLB, our 151 officer has to give assurance that not only is the commercial asset we are using the money for being bought for reasons 
other than primarily for yield, but also no other commercial asset is being bought for this reason by whatever means, including our reserves, for the following three years. Fortunately, the investment strategy we introduced with an eye to the possibility that government would restrict in some way commercial purchases, which breaks investments into three streams of investment types, enables us to meet the new PWLB rules and to be confident that we um, will take on board these uh, new, new rules. The new rules are not retrospective and do not affect existing loans such as that to Ermine Street, but new loans to it will be. Of course, this administration has repurposed Ermine Street so that it's now part of our housing strategy, helping us to deliver decent homes that are affordable to, to those uh, who live and work in the area. As I mentioned in my introduction to the previous item, on the general fund budget. Our medium term financial strategy requires us to find five million pounds over the coming four yeah. years. And some of this is to be found from new commercial investments. For the reasons I've given, this continues to be achievable as we now focus solely on stream two investments. We are in the process of amending our investment strategy accordingly, and this will come to you in due course. You will see from paragraph 10.3 on page 29 of the agenda pack that we also have to consider negative interest rates. Before we can come to the final agenda on the uh, final item on the agenda, I should like to take this opportunity to thank the head of finance and his team for producing this and indeed all the good documents for this meeting in exceptional and difficult circumstances brought about by the pandemic. Um, but that, um, thank you, and I'll be happy to answer questions on this now. Thanks. Thank you very much, and uh, I would also comment uh, and confirm the view that you have just expressed. This is these are excellent reports, and I thank uh, Peter and his team, and indeed you for your presentations. But may I come to questions? And the first is from Councillor Anna Bradford. Thank you, Chairman. And I too would like to thank uh, Peter Maddock and his team for a really easy to understand report. So thank you very much for that. Um, I wanted to understand um, if I can ask my question to Councillor Williams. Um, on page 64, we have commitments towards uh, investing in commercial assets to deliver positive financial return. Um, and I, I wanted to ask, um, there's a reference down at the bottom about existing housing and um, uh, the fact that energy conservation programmes are reduced but will continue. But I just wondered um, how in this investment plan we hope to deliver our aspirations for green um, improvement and green recovery going forward as we come out of the pandemic. Thank you. OK, I'm not quite sure I understand that. I um, I mean, it does say under existing housing, as you as you quite rightly point out, that um, we will continue with our um, energy conservation programmes. Um, and. You know, obviously everything we do is dependent on the income that we, we, we receive. Um, but I don't quite understand. I mean, it's, every, it's all our, as you know, green to our, our core is one of the fundamental uh, pillars of our business plan. So we will continue to be doing that. And so I'm, yeah, I, I, I you know, that's all I can say on it is that we will continue with our energy program um, and to, um, yeah. Sorry, uh, I can't see what more. I can say on that. Chairman, would it help if I clarified? <laughs> I think it might, yes please. Okay, um, so really I would suppose this is about, this paragraph at 3.8 is about existing housing, but I wondered um, whether we were planning to do more work on other buildings that we own that are not housing. Um, oh, 
Yes, I mean, if if it is possible to do that, we will. Um, I, I think I mentioned that the um, the PWLB, the new rules are not retrospective. Um, so work on existing buildings, if it's to improve their energy efficiency, will come within the new rules. So that won't prevent us from continuing to to um, to do that. Um, and it, as I say, it's one of our core policies to to wherever possible improve the energy efficiency of our buildings. Yeah. Thank you. That's yeah. good to hear. Thank you very much. Um, Chair, can I speak I was, um, before the last speaker? Is yes. that okay? Um, just one question, really for your point of view, um, Councillor Williams. Um, on page 16 of the report, paragraph 19, um, it refers to preventative action and it says it does, however, anticipate that cases of preventative action will be relatively rare. This is in um, um, response to the COVID recovery. I would have thought that maybe the opposite could be true. I mean, what are your thoughts or where do you think the direction of that will be going? I'm sorry, um, Councillor, but I'm I, I. What page are you referring to? I'm sorry, sorry I've got the agenda pack in front of me. There's got different page, page numbers. Page um, 16, paragraph page 19. 16. Page 16. Second paragraph near the top. I, my 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 pages are in the sorry my my, my pages oh. are in the um, 60s. Okay, shall I read the brief paragraph out? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. The, the government has chosen to issue guidance rather than strict definitions because of the challenges of developing strict definitions that reliably give the intended categorization when applied to something as diverse as local government. It does, however, anticipate that cases of preventative action will be relatively rare. Right. So in regards to the public works loan boards, um, you know, when you can apply for a loan and under what circumstances? OK, I'm still struggling to find it, actually. Um, okay. <laughs> Do you want to come back to it later? I think Peter can. I think Peter Maddock can help on this one. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I must admit, uh, Councillor Ripeth, when I saw this, I was slightly surprised. They thought that because I tend to agree. I, I, I'm not sure that it will be rare, but um, no, no, no. I am no, intending no. to try and speak to the PWLB to get a bit more clarity around some of the things that they're saying, because um, whilst they've issued their guidance. Um, it's still, it's still open to interpretation. Um, I've spoken to a number of commentators who have expressed views on what this actually means. I still don't think it's clear. Um, I think it will still develop over time. So um, I'm certainly intending to speak to PWLB, but I think I agree with you, Councillor Ripper, that I'm just not convinced that it will be that rare, to be honest, given the situation we're in at the moment, particularly. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I just thought the fact they'd put it in there in the first place surely would suggest that some people are thinking it's not going to be that rare and it is likely to be quite frequent. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we now come to Councillor Graham Cohn. Thank you, Chairman. Mine's just a quick question on the page 43 and um, in, in the table there where we talk about um, treasury um, investments, we've got the we've got um, 32.3 million in the bank effectively um, or in banks and building societies. I just wanted to know how quickly the council could draw down on that money, how sort of liquid it is if we really needed it, you know, or, or is it tied up? Um, I understand that the, the Shortest um, loan is is three months, but Peter might um, might be able to confirm that. Sorry, uh, Councillor Cameron, which paragraph are we looking at? We're on page forty three, Annex B, 
which is the oh, 43. Yeah. Yeah. Let's have a look. Um, under, under Treasury Investments, Banks and Building Secured. Yeah, so, yeah, so um, most of our liquid cash is held within money market funds. Um, that's got that's got nil in it. Yeah, I need to check that because I don't think it is nil. I do beg your pardon. That looks like it might be a mistake. Okay. We certainly have got money within our market money market funds. We do, even with the banks and building societies, we do have um, fairly short term investments with some some banks and building societies. Uh, sometimes a week, sometimes up to three weeks. So it's yeah. fairly short term, but our real liquid cash is held within our money market funds. So I do need to I do need to check on that because I don't believe it's nil. So that looks like an error. So thanks for thanks for raising that. Thanks very much. It's just obviously given the current crisis that we've had, we you know it's a good example of where we need to draw down on money quickly. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, yeah, ask the questionnaire. Thanks. Yeah. Peter, can I very quickly follow up on that and just ask that the are we comfortable that the banks and building societies that we are using? are um, high grade and unlikely to fail. So um, yeah, so we, so we do um, speak on a fairly regular basis with our Treasury advisors and they provide information on information to us on credit ratings. So we would only invest in banks and building societies so that are sort of double A rated and, and, and for institutions that um, they would be comfortable with. So, yeah, I, I'm confident that we wouldn't be investing with um, banks and building societies that are any lower than um, uh, than A or or possibly B plus, based on them um, advice that we receive from our from our treasury advisors on a regular basis. Thank you very much. Um, can I come now to Councillor De Lacy? Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, page 29 of the main uh, agenda pack. Uh, halfway down the page, uh, there is a diagram which I simply don't understand. I don't understand why it's there and I don't understand what it's saying. I would be grateful for some clarification, please. I, I don't know why it's there. I assumed it was just a, a graphic to run. Um... Happy to remove it if it's, um, if it's not adding anything. Chairman, what's it intended to add, please? Um, Peter, can you can you help with that? Um, I have to confess, I think this has been in here for the last couple of years and may even predate me. So yes. Let, let me. Um, So it's I'm certainly not that something now. that we've done this year. Probably, as Peter said, it probably goes back a few years and no one's really taken much attention of it, you know, to it. Um, it, it probably, um, I presume, is intended to show uh, that the income from investments is increasing. But in view of the revised circumstances that we face, that may not be the case in future. <laughs> So I would suggest probably yeah, the like best thing to do is to take it yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's um, let's review that paragraph from completely yeah. and, and see how relevant it is. But um, certainly um, we can take that. Yeah, if it's not relevant, we obviously need that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, have two more speakers, one of whom's Councillor Hazel Smith. I don't know if you want to take her first, and then also Councillor Richard Williams. Yes, yeah, so let's come to Councillor Hazel Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to come back on um, Councillor Bradman's question, which is an interesting one. Um, in paragraph 3.8, page 64 of the agenda pack, um, the fact that we were talking about reduced energy conservation programmes um, with the investment level lower due to reductions in rental income. That's, I was just checking where that had come from. Um, this refers to the four years of reduction in rental income, which is no longer happening. So I think that sentence 
probably needs to be amended. Um, it, it's historical and um, we will in fact have greater rental income going forward because um, we've come to the end of the four years of reducing council house rents by 1% per year. Um, so uh, that, that, that I think does need changing. Thank you for raising that. Thank you very much, that's helpful. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams. Richard. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I've, I've got a few points that, that um, relate to both the um, Treasury strategy and, and the capital strategy, um, if I may. Um, the, the, the first question is a general question, so so I appreciate it may, may well solicit a general answer. Um, but just on the um, environmental statement that we've added, um, I was just wondering if we could get a bit more of an idea as to what that's intended or what effect that's intended to have. I mean, are we talking, you know, a kind of invest, did divestment sort of strategy of not um, in not investing or in, in things that could be related to fossil fuels or, 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 or would it be more general than that? So I just welcome a, a little bit of, of clarity on which, which that. Page you, which page do you want, please? Sorry, I should have said chair. Sorry, my fault. Uh, well, I've put it on page 23. It appears in a, a few yeah. points in the document, okay. but yeah. page 23 of the Treasury Management Strategy, but it, it's yes. a few other places as well. Um, but as I say, I appreciate it's a general question, so so a general answer will be fine. Um, still sticking with the Treasury um, Strategy, um, I appreciate the paragraphs on, on the PWLB. I think they, they, they are fine at 812. I had a, a more general point, though, and this applies to both policies is that we we acknowledge the change in the Public Works Loan Board, but then at various points, both both policies actually then sort of refer to us having a programme of investment in commercial property, which, which slightly made me think, are we just paying lip service to the PWLB? So, for example, page 28, 9, 10, it says the council continues to pursue a programme of investment in, in commercial property. So, I guess I'm just interested in how, you know, the changes to the Public Works Loan Board relate to that, given that we, we keep restating quite a few times, actually, that we're going to continue to invest in, in commercial property. Um, next question, sticking with paragraph 9, 10 on page 28, I just wondered if we could get an idea of what the significance of the addition of the word ordinarily there is in relation to the MRP. Um, MRP will ordinarily be provided for um, revised um mhclg guidance um so why was the word ordinarily um added what significance does that have when would we imagine not apply uh, not um you know of using mrp because the implication there seems to be that sometimes it won't be used um and then just moving on sorry i appreciate there are quite a few points uh moving on to the capital strategy um, page 64, paragraph 3.2. It's just a grammatical point and I apologise for being a pedant. Can we, can we come to that under agenda item 8 please? Oh yeah, sure, sorry. I wasn't sure if we were taking both because yeah, some, no, some... Let's, let's just deal with the Treasury Management Strategy first and then we'll come right. to yeah. the Capital no, Strategy sure, later. I, I wasn't sure Thank if you. some members had referred to both, so that's fine. Thank you. Councillor John Williams, over to you. OK, um, I'll leave the MRP point to to um, Mr Maddox, yeah. um, but on on the um, um, on, on your. So I've forgotten your first point, actually, Richard, you went through. <laughs> Sorry, I it, it was it was a long it was a long time. Um, it was the environmental statement and, and the, the what's the significance of that? Are we imagining, you know, adopting a kind of divestment approach of not not touching fossil okay. fuel related industries? Or uh, OK, OK. Um, most as you'll see, most our investments, it, we don't have any direct investments with um, with fossil fuel companies or companies that are um, directly involved with fossil fuel. Uh, our, our, um, most of our money is, is tied up in banks, uh, building societies and um, local other local authorities. Um, obviously, those banks and building societies may have interests in uh, fossil fuel companies, but to be honest with you, the amount of effort that it would take for us to identify every single 
piece of interest by by a bank or building society it will just not be practical it's clearly we would not directly um we would not directly um um invest in a fo in in fossil fuel company um or anything to do that goes against our aim of, of uh, zero carbon by by 2050 so clearly that policy um you know is carried throughout everything the council does and that would include um investing investing our, our funds there is obviously an issue with regard to the pension fund um and indeed that's something that we're currently looking at um and there may well become something coming to full council on that but so far as um you know our, our investments um then the the guide for that is our commitment to zero carbon for the district uh by 2050 and clearly um that will be taken into account whenever we invest in um in in um you know an organization or a business um but as i say if you look at the um where we do invest at the moment um then um which is given on page um page 46 i think is oh no, 40, uh, uh, 40 43 um you'll see that our investments um we're not we do not directly invest in in any any fossil fuel company thank you very much was that all your I, uh, uh, there were two other points but i think uh mr maddock was going to take yeah, this uh, peter's going to respond to them thanks peter all right um i'm trying to remember this i know the third point was um used the use of the word ordinarily wasn't it yeah. yeah um so um the way the guidance is written is that um there's an expectation on local authorities that they will provide minimum revenue um and this, um, setting aside money for the repayment of debt. So, um, ordinarily, yes, um, we would provide minimum revenue where we've purchased um, an asset or built an asset that we've borrowed money for, so we set aside money to repay that debt. There is, however, scope to, um, in some circumstances, not to provide a minimum revenue provision. If we believe that um, that asset in particular, we're not perhaps going to hold for a particularly long time and, there, and we're going to sell it uh, in the future. So there would possibly be situations where you wouldn't necessarily provide minimum revenue provision. Um, I would generally guard against that um, as it's not necessarily particularly prudent, but um, if there was a case where we felt that MRP wasn't appropriate, we would probably seek advice from our Treasury advisors just to just to take their view to see whether they would agree with that. And we would also speak to our external auditors uh, and see whether they also agree. It's not an approach that um, we would ordinarily take as, as it's suggested, but it's possible there might be a situation where we would be over prudent. Um, the other issue, of course, is that MRP does affect the revenue budget. It is a charge to our revenue budget. So we don't want to overcharge to our revenue budget, um, particularly in times of, of um, you know, when financial, uh, in, in particular, particularly now with them, um, the issues we face with local, in local, local government finance. So, um, and sorry, what was the second point? Um, My second that. point was, was it was a more general point, but it was just about the fact that we, we acknowledged the change to the PWLB, but then at various points in the, in the, oh yeah, let's uh, see, we, we, we continue yes. to say we're going to, have a program investment in commercial property so yeah so so yeah i mean the, the pwlb rules do not prevent us from continuing to invest in commercial property um we just it should not be primarily for yield and so you know it is quite possible for us to invest in a commercial property that needs renovation that needs repurposing like 270 cambridge um, Science Park. So it doesn't prevent us from investing in commercial property. We just have to demonstrate that we are not doing it just 
purely for commercial yield or for, for gain. Councillor Williams, could I just follow up on that? And if we were to invest in commercial property purely for yield, uh, are you suggesting, therefore, that we would have to go to the money markets and borrow at commercial rates? If we didn't want to use the Public Works Loan Board for three years, yes. Okay. The problem okay. we've got is that um, if the Public Works Loan Board new rules prevent us from invest, even using our own reserves to invest in a property uh, purely for commercial yield in those three years when we take out a Public Works Loan Board. So that would prevent us from doing that. We have, you know, I mean, Mr Maddox and his team has been looking at the market and seeing whether or not it would be advantageous for us to do that. But to be honest, it looks as though it would be, we are, we are better off staying with the Public Works Loan Board and therefore we will have to accept um, these new rules. But as I said earlier, we believe that you know, we are we will be able to work with these new rules. It will prevent us maybe from purchasing a supermarket or or something outside our area. But to be honest with you, I we believe there's there are plenty of opportunities um, to keep within those rules, and therefore it will not prevent us from continuing to invest in commercial property in order but but in for circumstances that will meet the new criteria thank you chair we have one speaker left councillor hunt councillor steve hunt steve thank you chair um yeah just going back to these unsecured investments um which on page 43 notes there's 32 uh, 32 ish million um and on page 31 we have section 10.19 investment limits where it notes that there are 18 million of revenue reserves available to cover such losses. Um, and then it goes on to say that in order that available reserves will not be put at risk for unsecured investments, in the case of a single default, the maximum of any one such investment will be 10 million. That seems like quite a lot. Um, and, and if there were two of them, then we'd have blown our 18 million reserve. And so my question really is, do we really have single investments that big or, or is this 32.3 million typically split up into into rather smaller investments? How, how are we exposed like that and how do we protect against such a big hit as 10 million? Yeah, so, so we wouldn't have um, one amount of 10 million. It is split over a number of banks and building societies. Typically amounts range from two to possibly five, but mostly two to three million each individual investment is that sort of level. I see, thank you. Do you wish to come back or are you content? I'm, I'm reasonably content with that as long as we do, you know, I, I can see the 10 million is, is there as a maximum. It's good to know we're not actually approaching that indeed. in any one investment. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Good point. Um, I think, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the uh, end of the discussion on that particular report on the Treasury Management Strategy. Uh, we are recommended to consider and comment, which we have duly done. And with your approval, we will move on to item eight. Is everyone content? Yes. Thank you very much, Dave. So item eight on the agenda is the capital strategy. And this is um, Councillor Williams, your final act this evening. I yes, think. Thank, thank you very much. Well, I'll be very brief in this last one. Um, it's the final last item and like the previous one um, this is an annual review um, again the changes are uh, in red ink and again the main change has been to accommodate the new PWLB rules uh, but I should also draw your attention to paragraph 9.3 on paragraph on page 71 uh, this is a new paragraph which ties the capital strategy into the investment strategy and its role in delivering the medium term financial strategy. So um, on, on that, that's my um, my final my final note for tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, 
Do we have any questions on this report? Yes, Councillor Daunton. Um, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, it's a question, um, page 65, um, the bullet point efficiency through technology. Um, I just wanted uh, some reassurance that the investment in technology to deliver digital solutions, the, the transformation work that Jeff Membry is heading up, that's independent of what's going on uh, with um, our part in the ICT service, or is it dependent on ICT, the ICT service? Councillor Williams. Um, both really, isn't it? Because it's got to run on the ICT um, service, um, but it's been dealt it's been um, um, it's yeah it it's been delivered by us uh, yeah. independent of the three ICT service but it's got to obviously be compatible yeah with I understand the, um, ICT service mm -hmm. okay I understand that. So actually, you you have answered my question. That is, oh, we, that's our own independent um, program of work, uh, transformation work. Obviously, in terms of the hardware, um, it would it be dependent on ICT, well, hardware and software. But mm. the project itself, the program, it's is our project. Being, it's our project being led by us for yeah. us. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. That's good to know. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm sorry, this is a real pedant's point, but this is um, paragraph 3.2. Um, it's just the first sentence, which, which, which I thought might be phrased a little bit better. Um, it says, against the background of limited government support, the capital programme identifies the total investment needed to support the achievement of the Council's aims and objectives such as housing, economic development and climate emergency. That climate emergency on the end didn't, didn't, didn't really make sense to me as to what are we seeking to achieve in relation to, to, to the climate emergency. So I wonder if we might slightly rephrase that because it didn't quite make sense to me. Um, uh, so that, that that's a tiny point, really, just just a point of drafting. Um, th there was just one point, it does relate back to my other point, Chair, if, if I may, it was just on this Public Works Loan Board point and, and the reference to investment in commercial assets. I, I take what um, Councillor John Williams said um, at, at the start that, of course, the changes don't prevent all investments in, in, in commercial assets. Um, I mean, I, I assume, given the way it's written, we don't want to close it down. So we don't want to say in both policies, actually, um, in accordance with the PWLB rules, we will continue to in, in invest in commercial assets because we want to keep open the possibility mm. of going to the money markets. Is, is that right? That's deliberate. Yeah, absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Anna Bradley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, rather like um, Councillor De Lacey's uh, observation that there was a graphic, um, I just do wonder what the relevance of the graphic on the bottom of our page 72 and uh, item 12 reference documents and relevant documents is. There's a, a graphic on a black background which it's quite hard to read because it's quite small and I'm not sure it adds to our understanding of reference documents and relevant documents. I suppose it's a sort of summary in pictorial terms, is it? Is that what it's supposed to represent? I have to say I thought that was quite helpful because it showed <laughs> yeah. the four strategies at the bottom building up into the corporate plan, which is allied to the West Wellbeing Plan and overall to our capital ambition. OK, well, if if you as well, chairman feel it's an OK graphic, then I'm OK with it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> could, could we make the graphic a little bigger, please, chairman, so that yeah. those of us with the old papers going home can read it? Um, if I could find it, Councillor Hales, I have it to hand somewhere. I could loan my magnifying glass to you. <laughs> but, Councillor Ripper. Thank you. Um, this is probably the million dollar question. On page 69 of our papers, paragraph 8.1, um, discussion about um, cash 
and short term cash. My question is, how do we make sure we have enough of short cash in the short term? You know, considering the situation we're in at the moment. Well, well, first of all, um, we don't necessarily need to draw on our reserves to deal with short term deficits. And in fact, you wouldn't want to do that because the cost of borrowing is so cheap at the moment that it will be. It would be better to keep our funds um, and borrow money to cover short term deficits. Um, so it's not necessarily the case that you need to have money on that short term um, call, call down um, to deal with um, deficits. I mean, first of all, you will, you know, if, if you're managing the budget properly, you will know when you're going to need it, when, when you're going to go into deficit. And normally we go into deficit uh, towards the end of the financial year um, because of the, the way that the council tax comes in. Um, but you don't then use money out of your reserves to cover that. You tend to borrow to take you into the next financial year, because otherwise it would actually cost you money if you took money out of your your reserves to do that more than it would going to cost you to borrow the money. So um, it's not necessarily true that you should always need to have uh, at very short notice the ability to get hold of money because if you do that, then you're not managing your council finances very well. Thank you. That answers my question. Good. Thank you very much. And I have no more speakers. And I know that we are asked to ask once, once again uh, to consider and comment on the report, which we have uh, duly done. So having done that, I propose that we uh, move on to item nine, if everyone is content. Agreed. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and just before we do start, move to item nine. Could I thank Councillor Williams and Peter Maddock for their contributions this evening? It's been a bit of a marathon, uh, but I thank you both very much for your frank answers to our questions and your very helpful answers as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, agenda item nine, ladies and gentlemen, is the Scrutiny and Overview Committee work programme. And you'll see that uh, February is looking fairly busy at the moment. There may well be uh, items come in and uh, yet may be items which will drop out. I am expecting that we will have reports from two task and finish groups. Um, one looking at one which has been looking at the uh, equality and diversity, which is led by Councillor Sarah Chong Johnson, and the uh, COVID 19 update, uh, both of which I hope will report next month. Uh, and we have the other items listed, but uh, prior to the next meeting, the Vice Chairman and I will uh, we, we'll speak with uh, Democratic Services and we will uh, agree a final agenda. But so that is really to uh, keep you aware that. Dinner might be late. Uh, and if everyone is happy with that, can I ask you to take note that the next meeting will take place on Thursday, the 25th of February 2021 at 5.20 p.m. And with that, I thank you all very much for your attendance, for your contributions. Uh, I wish you a very pleasant evening and I look forward to seeing you all very soon. In fact, some of you I will see at the JDCC tomorrow, which looks like being a bit of a marathon. Was. But for now, good evening and thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Good night. 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 Thank you.